Well, good afternoon to all of you who uh, have decided to join us. I'm going to ask my fellow fellow panelists if they would turn on their cameras and unmute their phones. I see Mr. Jonathan Yarborough. I know Representative Pendarvis uh, is on the call on this event. And Senator McLeod, if we would ask you if you would unmute yourself and uh, join us uh, via your camera so we can uh, start this conversation. Uh, let me start what my mother and father uh, taught me to be the two most important words in the English language. Uh, and those words are thank you. Uh, first to the South Carolina chapter of the Association of Blacks and Energy. Let me thank you all for your kindness and asking uh, little of me to moderate this conversation, certainly to my dear friend Rondo Bannon from Dominion Energy. Uh, thank you, Rondo, for being kind enough to extend the invitation. And to Ms. Mary Ann, who's celebrating 40 years at Dominion Energy, and all those who are working behind the scenes. Thank you all for what you have done and what you're doing to make this event possible. And to all of you who've joined us uh, today uh, on a Tuesday, let me thank you for the work that you're doing not only to make your community better, to make the state better, but also to move us toward that ever so perfect union that we read about uh, in elementary school and we strive our best to do in our everyday living. Uh, today, we have such a dynamic panel and I wanna start by uh, scratching the surface in terms of my introductions to them. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't even call it introduction. I think it's more presenting uh, because their body of work speaks very loudly for them. First, I'll start with someone I like to call, he's a mover, a shaker, and a decision maker, uh, Mr. Jonathan Yarbrough, who is the Regional Policy Director uh, for Dominion Energy. Jonathan, I thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and to my low country brother, a state representative from the 113th District in South Carolina, uh, Representative Marvin Pendarvis. Marvin is husband, he's a father, a very successful lawyer, and I want to thank him for his service to the state and to my sister from another mister, a uh, young lady who grew up um, in the PD region of the state, uh, made history by serving as the first African American uh, to represent South Carolina Senate District 22. You know her for her uh, accountability emails and her loud voice on issues that matter to the people she represents and to the people of South Carolina. That's Senator Mia McLeod. I want to thank you. Uh, for your service and all that you do. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. Um, Jonathan, I'll start with you. Uh, uh, in Sunday school at AME Church, we learned that no one can tell your testimony like you. And so we, I mentioned your title. I flirted with some of the things about you, but please tell us your journey from there to here. Uh, and I wouldn't even say in a real way, because that would take probably two or three weeks, but at least scratch the service in terms of telling us about your journey. Well, you already read it like my mama wrote it, so I don't know <laughs> what else there is to say. But uh, no, I, how I got into government affairs is I uh, was an attorney at one point, and uh, I couldn't figure out how to run it like a business, frankly. Uh, I all, but I didn't like uh, the rest that came along with it. And I went and worked for Department of Commerce for a year as their legislative person, then went over to the Department of Health and Environmental Control just to sort of learn a, a complicated regulatory agency. And with those roles, you don't really have to reach out to legislators. They're reaching out to you, especially with DHEC, because there's a multitude of constituent problems. And then I had this opportunity with this uh, company called Scanna, and it seemed like the cushiest job in the world in late 2015. So, I mean, I took that job because there's never any big issues in the utility world, um, which changed a little bit in 2017, I should say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's been a great experience. I've loved understanding, getting to know the utility world. It's a complicated uh, industry. Um, and, it, and it's a challenge sometimes to take what we do on this side and communicate it over to government officials who are dealing with a myriad of issues day in and day out. But that's a little bit about how I got into this world, Antoine. And, and let me just say to all of our guests who are joining us, please note uh, that this conversation is being recorded. Uh, I will repeat, it is being recorded uh, for future use, potentially. So please, ma'am, please, sir, govern yourselves accordingly with that in mind. Uh, Senator McLeod, uh, I, I read sometime around fifth grade, 
that well-behaved men and women rarely make history. Uh, if that's true, and we know it to be true, you've been misbehaving all of your life. Uh, <laughs> and that's why partly have you have risen to the ranks that you have uh, in both your life and your career as a mother, uh, law school graduate, served in the House, now serving in the State Senate, public relations executive. I can go on and on and on until Christ come back. But how did you get uh, a little girl from Marlboro County, funeral home family, to now one of the most influential legislatures in the state of South Carolina? Well, I, um, I, had, a, I had parents who really believe that the only way to make our community better is to is to serve and to you know not just sit on the sidelines and complain about what we don't like or what we disagree with so i kind of got my start in politics um in college i was a page for then representative david beasley and uh that kind of exposed me to the chaos of the south carolina house I didn't realize that I would one day serve. I uh, had no desire, no intentions of serving at that point in, in my life. But as God would have it, that's that's where I uh, that's where I, that's the seat that I ran for first. And I got into politics to um, make a difference. Uh, I know that may sound cliche-ish, but it is it is true. But I think the more important thing is the reason I decided to stay in politics, because that wasn't um, something that I, that was a really tough decision for me. Um, but I decided to stay in politics and to run for the Senate seat when it, when it uh, became open, because I now know my purpose. And um, I had the courage to lead, and as you said, I like to use my big voice uh, for the people, and being a voice for them is is everything. Uh, and, and let me also remind our guests, if you have questions, there will be a point uh, in today's worship service where you will be able to add them to the chat box, and I'm sure our guests would love to hear from you. Uh, Marvin Pendarvis, I wrote a couple of weeks ago in an op, in an op ed piece that uh, Little boys with dreams grow up to be men with vision. Uh, I think we can put background color to the Marvin Pendarvis story when we use that quote. Uh, talk about your journey from a little boy with dreams, now a man, a husband, and a father, a state legislator, a lawyer um, who's doing his thing. Well, first off, thank you, uh, Antoine. Good to see you, Mia and Jonathan. And, and thank you for the people who put this together. Um, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm still that little boy with a dream. And I, I look back on my life and, and it started, you know, uh, really in a, in a neighborhood here in North Charleston called Charleston Farms. And I'm the son of a single mom, the only boy of five children. And for me, um, you know, getting involved was something that came as a result of life circumstances. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go off to the University of South Carolina on scholarship, matriculate through there, go off to law school. And when it came to what I was going to do once I graduated from law school, um, I did not expect that my life's journey would take me back to Charleston. In fact, Antoine, I, it was my intention uh, to go elsewhere. And you know, I thought I wanted to be in Atlanta. I thought I wanted to be in D.C., Charlotte, someplace where I felt like I can make the kind of impact that I dreamed of, you know, that, that little boy with the dream. But God called me elsewhere. You know, it was in 2015 when the Mother Emanuel um, tragedy happened in Charleston. It was 2015 when Walter Scott was shot in the back nine times. And I found my voice. Um, I got involved as a young attorney who wanted to help people, who wanted to make his imprint on the community. And through that, uh, you know, public service, uh, you know, chose me. You know, I, I didn't, you know, I, I tell people I didn't seek this. It chose me. You know, I was, um, you know, elevated to a place where they thought that I would be good to run for city council. I ran that race and I lost that race, Antoine. Um, but I tell people it's the greatest loss of my life uh, because it was from that loss that I continued to get involved in the Charleston community. 
and from then there was a an opportunity that opened in the South Carolina House of Representatives in 2017 and the rest is history and you're looking at that little boy who's still dreaming who's still hoping for an opportunity to make the kind of impact on this community that the people elected me to uh, the, the young boy who saw our community impacted from so many areas from housing to food insecurity to economic deprivement you know uh, that boy is still dreaming that boy is still hoping and that boy believes that we can be better uh, than than what we've shown and i hope that as long as i'm in office um, i will continue to inspire little other other little boys to dream and to accomplish their goals and to realize their fullest potential you know representative Finn Darvis, that um hip hop for lot that uh, I'm sorry that R&B philosopher Fantasia said mm. sometimes you got to lose to win again. That's right. That's right. That's right. Story That's right. of Marvin Pendarvis. Uh Senator McLeod, uh it's a it's a it's a day today is one of the days we pause and reflect. Uh, we pray, but we also evaluate uh, how far we come and how far we got to go. I have to go. One year ago today, uh, George Floyd uh, was murdered by a police officer uh in minnesota um it was a shockwave to the country um i think it was a shockwave to the nerve center known as the american experiment um just like the mother emmanuel tragedy was unfortunately both at the federal level and the local level while so much has changed downstream not much has changed upstream we just ended the legislative session here in south carolina um as you reflect on today as you reflect on the past several months being in Columbia, I'm sure there's some frustration, disappointment. I'm sure there's some things you wish could have been done that did not get done. Talk about this session, what it means for you, but also what today means for you as a father of uh, some young black boys. Today is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's even one year later, it, it's still such a sobering moment, um, not just for us, here in South Carolina, but for the world um, who, I mean, all of us watched on May 25th of last year. And we were, I believe, a captive audience at that point because of the pandemic. Um, and that was divinely ordered because God had to stop all of us um, in our tracks so that we could see and and hear and experience what that what that what that moment was like, not just for George Floyd, but for all of us who witnessed um, his brutal murder. And as I I've been thinking about it honestly since it happened, every day it. Um, you know, it's it's always on my mind and heart because I am a mom and I do have two young adult black sons who I am deeply concerned about. I wrote something uh, right after George Floyd's murder uh, and it was just thinking out loud and getting my thoughts on paper about what we need to do after the protest because protests are, are good and they are they are definitely needed but we are at, at a time um in our in, in our country and and in this moment where we have to act we are we're not in a position of um you know just just looking and wondering and waiting for others to do the work that we know needs to be done and that that's a mandate i believe and a call to action that george floyd um gave us when he took his last breath um so i, I would just say that there are so many things that we can do at the state level here in south carolina i mean we are not every day since then it seems another unarmed black man or woman has been murdered by law enforcement officers um, in South Carolina and around the country. And that the only way to to act 
as opposed to always having to react when those things happen, is to, is to be proactive and pass the legislation at state and federal levels that we know we need. I introduced a bill called the Transparency and Justice Act, and it does a number of things. It makes hate a crime, as you know, we were unsuccessful in passing a uh, hate crimes bill this year, and I'm, I'm, I hate to even say that I'm always floored by that, but it's, um, it, it's just unbelievable, un, unconscionable that we would have lost nine um, South Carolinians in one of the most heinous race-based uh, hate crimes in, in the world, and here we are again six years later and we still don't have a hate crimes bill. We never passed Representative Gilliard's bill. Um, I fully support that, but I've also introduced the Transparency and Justice Act that I believe goes further than just hate crime. It does make hate a crime, but it also bans chokeholds by police and it, um, it, it bans no-not warrants. Um, as you know, we also know what happened in Breonna Taylor's case and so many others. And it, and it also gets rid of qualified immunity in unjustified officer-involved shootings. So there are things in addition to passing the George uh, Floyd Justice and Policing Act at the federal level, there are things that we can do and should be doing collectively right here in South Carolina to make sure that what happened to George Floyd doesn't continue to happen to our uh, young men and women across South Carolina. Representative Pendarvis, you know, I always say to my friends uh, in the business community and other groups that what seems to be um, on the uh, calendar sometimes is not made a priority um, in South Carolina. Uh, we talk about an agenda, but sometimes those items on the agenda never equate to being passed in terms of legislation and a priority. Give some background color to your priority, House member. Uh, and feel free um, to open up your closet door about your frustration and things that you wanted to see passed that did not pass for one reason or another. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll open my remarks, Antoine, by, by stating that it is not lost on me the importance of today. And so I, I wanted to just, you know, be it being the year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And, you know, I, I echo Senator McLeod's comments and so much of my work over the last year has been with that in mind. And so just as a threshold matter, I wanted to, to acknowledge that because it is an important day. Um, and, you know, I believe that we've made some strides over the last year, but there are some ways that we have to go. And I hope that as we move forward in our work as a legislative body, we recognize the need uh, for actionable uh, change her. Uh, now, to that point, we talk about how things operate in Colombia, the fact that there might be an agenda, uh, that we might not get to that agenda. Um, I came into this year uh, prioritizing uh, three things, Antoine. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work on how we could address uh, criminal justice reform, in the wake of George Floyd and so many others that have been victims of the system. I wanted to look at how we could improve the economic standing of communities that have been traditionally challenged. And I wanted to address uh, housing insecurity uh, that's so rampant across South Carolina and really the country. And we have not uh, done a good job of addressing. And in fact, the pandemic only exacerbated the issue uh, even more. And um, part of my frustration, I will tell you, is um, I'm a South Carolinian born and bred, you know, born here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I have a deep amount of gratitude, respect, admiration for um, where our state has been and where our state is going. But I believe in order for us to get to the point where we are addressing issues that impact the lives of all South Carolinians, we can't continue to play political games, Antoine. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. We can't continue to ignore the issues that are in front of us. And we've got to address them head on. Part of my frustration is that we talked a lot about issues that, in my view, are inconsequential to the day to day lives of many South Carolinians, whether it's abortion, whether it's dealing with the electric chair or a firing squad or open carry or so many of these other partisan polarizing issues that have taken up the debate in the General Assembly this past year. We have to get to a point where we're saying, what are we doing to improve the lives of South Carolinians, Antoine? Mm -hmm. What are we doing to make sure that they're able to go back home and they're able to say, you know what? My representatives are working to make sure that I can put extra food on my table, that I've got more money in my pocket, that I have the ability to climb up the economic ladder, that I've got quality housing, a quality education, and that I'm living in a community where I feel safe and protected. But we've ignored that because we're trying to score political points. We continue to get into these toxic, partisan, bickering jabs. And that's not to paint the picture that it's like that every day in the South. I'm not trying to paint the picture that we're like Congress because we're far and away from how it is in Congress. Mm -hmm. But I do have frustrations at the pace at which meaningful legislation has taken this year. And I think we have an obligation to do better by the people that have elected us to serve them. And so with that in mind, I will continue to be the um, to sound the alarm when it comes to issues of consequence, when it comes to issues that impact people where they are, that the issues that are going to improve the communities, as I listed before, when it comes to housing, education, when it comes to criminal justice reform, when it comes to things that impact people's lives on a day to day basis. We have an obligation to the people of South Carolina to do better. And me personally, I feel like I have a special obligation uh, to the community that I represent and to my own moral compass uh, to be a better representative in a body that um, that is elected to serve the people. And so I thank you for the question. And, and certainly, I'm, you know, we've done some things this year, but, you know, we could do a whole lot more. And I hope that we will challenge ourselves to do more going forward. I'm going to speed up our pace a little bit because I yep. do want to give our audience to um, give them a chance to answer some questions. Jonathan, I want to pivot to you. If you ask most people uh, in this state what the hell sign and die means, most people would not know. <laughs> but we know the legislative session just concluded. Can you um, give us uh, some definition to the term sign and die? And from an energy perspective in the state, um, what this session uh, meant in terms of the conversation around energy? Uh, and if you can, uh, give us the Sunday school version of the answer so we can cover some ground here going forward. Sure, I'll be real quick. Um, so sine die, I haven't looked it up in a while, but I, it's Latin for, I think, until we meet again, essentially, is what it is. Um, and so it's the last day of session. Uh, and session is defined by the Constitution as the, the second Tuesday in January, and now the second Tuesday in May. Is that right? I mean, the second Thursday in May is, is when it adjourns. And so on that last day, uh, they call that sine die. You've adjourned, but you can come back and do some things, but it's defined in what's called a sine die resolution. And so there's a number of things that are in the sine die resolution this year, including the budget, because we had a huge surplus this year, $1.7 billion. Um, and then like conference committees and things of that nature. So on the energy front, um, you know, I, I'll just be frank with you from a utility perspective, post-2017, we're almost in the mode of do no harm. It, it, we're not we don't have some aggressive agenda. We're just trying to be good providers of, of energy, uh, help folks who need help, like through our customer assistance programs, and just try not to uh, to get hurt legislatively, I guess is the best way to put it. But there are a couple of things that the legislature, one is uh, they still hadn't dealt with C&T Cooper. And uh, the Senate version was a series of reforms, some board changes, things of the like. The House version had all those same things, but it also had a piece that allowed to look at any future proposals that might out might be out there for the sale of Santee Cooper. 
they had a process uh, the last year and a half, two years. There were no viable proposals, quite frankly. There was one, but it just didn't make um, economic sense for the state. Uh, and so uh, the other thing, the other energy issue, and by the way, there's a conference committee on that tomorrow. So the resolution of that may or may not happen tomorrow between the House and the Senate version on Santee Cooper. Other issues, there was a vehicle electrification bill, Antoine. Uh, electrification is coming strong. I mean, I, I was behind a Tesla today. You see them everywhere on the road right now. We don't necessarily have the infrastructure in place in South Carolina for it to completely replace gas, gas vehicles. And so there was a bill passed, uh, 304, I believe it was, S304, that just sort of set the stage, made it a policy priority for the PSC to look at. Um, and, and it did some other things so that, you know, charging stations aren't considered utilities. So charge point or Tesla can actually put a char put a charging station out there and charge by the kilowatt hour rather than time increments. But it's getting on us on that trajectory to be prepared for the oncoming electrification. So that was probably, that and Santee Cooper were probably two biggest energy things that were done this year, Antoine. Uh, so, Senator McLeod, uh, you have uh, taken on everyone uh, including me at times, uh, and, and the utility companies too. Uh, but for the sake of this group, um, the South Carolina chapters of relaxing energy, why do you think it's important uh, to speak up and speak out about the issue, particularly issues like utility companies um, who have been known to kind of just operate at their own pace and in their own way? Uh, why is it important for you as a legislature to be loud and use your lion share voice uh, to talk about these issues? Well, um, if not me, then who? Um, I, Antoine, you know that I, um, I kind of think one of the quote, I'll, I'll, I'll share my philosophy through um, one of my favorites, Angela Davis uh, quotes. She said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. And um, that's why I introduced the Rate Payer Protection Act. Mm -hmm. um, I was not aware, well, that's why I introduced all of the legislation that I introduced. A lot of thought and prayer goes into the bills that I introduced because I, uh, especially during the pandemic, I saw um, I saw the needs of South Carolinians in ways that I had not seen them before. Uh, the pandemic exposed a lot. I mean, we had record deaths, record unemployment. People are still hurting and still trying to recover from uh, a pandemic that we are still in. Mm -hmm. um, so. I introduced the Rate Payer Protection Act when I realized that South, uh, currently South Carolina law is written so that it protects the public utilities. It does nothing to protect our rate payers. And I am a rate payer of multiple utilities that have sought um, um, increases, rate increases, even during the pandemic, uh, even during the height of the pandemic. And when I tell you people, I mean, my phones have been blowing up with people who like me are financially impacted by the, the pandemic. I don't know, I don't know many people who are. Um, and I've got folks in my district and, and in my community who are on fixed incomes and you name it, I mean, people are hurting. And they're still reeling from the impact of, of a global pandemic and epic public health crisis uh, that, that South Carolina did not manage very well. And so we are, you know, that that bill was introduced to cause the public utilities to kind of take a minute, you know, just take, take a minute, blow your roll. People are hurting. Like, don't add insult to injury. Don't, you know, kick us while we're already down. Like, these monopolies, a lot of these companies are monopolies, and they can afford 
to take the hits during the pandemic instead of putting it on the backs of South Carolinians who are already hurt. So my bill, in a nutshell, basically requires that if if a public utility has already started that process uh, before the governor issues the state of uh, declares a state of emergency. Um, that would halt the process for those public utilities and, you know, provide some short term relief for ratepayers so that they aren't um, saddled with rate increases at a time when they can least afford it. So um, we are still I'm still working with uh, my friends who who represent those public public utilities to make sure that uh, my, my goal is not to hurt um, our public utilities, but to find some balance when it comes to just making sure that we are protecting ratepayers in this process as well. Uh, this was, of course, the first pandemic in, in our lifetimes. I'm sure there will be others, and I'm sure there will be other states of emergency, but we have we have a responsibility. I feel like I have a responsibility as a legislator to make sure that I'm doing everything within my power to protect the people that I represent. And so that uh, that act was birthed out of a need that I saw um, when these utilities went to the PSC and requested rate increases during the pandemic. Representative Pendagos, you flirted with this uh, early when you talked about affordable housing. Um, uh, until now, until recent, I couldn't always could not always connect the dots with affordable housing and how it impacts every single aspect of our lives, every single aspect, including conversations around energy. Can you help connect the dots further of how your advocacy, your championing affordable housing, impacts? pretty much every corner of every corner of the square here in South Carolina, including in yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. You couldn't have said it any better, Antoine. You know, I, I ran on affordable housing when I got elected to the House, and, and I'm still running on it because it's an issue that if we are, are not careful, it's, it's going to become a larger problem. I'll tell you this. Um, I, 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 I liken it to um, a structure. You know, I, I tell people when you look at a housing, you look at a traditional house. So you've got the foundation, you've got the walls, you've got the the roof. And when we think about it like that, and you think about all and you look at the the walls and everything around how we look at how society goes, you have to start where? With the foundation. I think having quality housing is is what is the important thing here and when we talk about energy and how it touches on it um so critically you know one of the things that i've had conversations with my colleagues about is if we're you know as we look at you know part of the problem is there are not enough um quality affordable um however you define that housing in the neighborhoods that need them right i live here in charleston where we know housing costs are rising astronomically and we're not able to keep up with them you know you know the cost of building a house is so much and so it's not advantageous to the builders and the developers to be able to 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 build the kind of housing that's going to sustain families and as we look at that you know the conversation has to shift from you know just looking at it as just housing but from an infrastructure standpoint mm -hmm. and how do we make sure that we are uh, creating cities, building thriving communities that have the infrastructure to sustain families that are relocating here uh, to sustain communities in a way that's going to build um, a, a vibrant area. And so the energy um, component comes into it because obviously so much of that deal, you know, as you build houses, as you, you know, you develop areas, you're going to need to make sure that there's some kind of connectivity, uh, that there's that, that that the energy gets to a certain place. 
And if we're not making sure that we're having the kind of housing in the areas that need them, then these are people who are lacking and, and missing out on the resources uh, that are going to be extremely critical uh, to them from an infrastructure standpoint. And so that's why we, we can't ignore what's been happening. And, and that's some of the things that I've been saying as I've continued this fight. Jonathan, add some further background color to it, at least from your perspective, because my grandma used to say where you sit determines what you see. <laughs> well, first, I do want to say this. The, the only thing I ever asked for in government affairs, and I, you know, sometimes I get it, most of the time I get it, sometimes I don't, is an opportunity to be heard. And Senator McLeod is awesome about hearing what I got to say and us having good conversations about it. She's got a job to do to represent her constituents. I've got a job to do, and we have these conversations, and I think she enlightens me, and I think maybe sometimes I enlighten her on how some things work. But, uh, you know, and when we talked about her, her bill, 344, yeah, I was able to tell her about the 17 million people we've helped since COVID started with financial assistance through community action agencies, Christina Freeman and Marianne Wright, um, unbelievable group that we have at Dominion that helps folks. I know Dukes has the same thing. Um, and then we just kind of talk about how investor-owned utilities work. I mean, we're a capital-intensive uh, organization that we have to continuously invest in our grid, uh, and we get that money from shareholders, and they, they're not giving us their money for free. At some point, they want it back with a little bit of return on it. And I understand, Senator McLeod, the timing was bad. Okay, I get that. And, and But we get to have these conversations. And that's what I love about my job is that I get to talk to really smart people like Senator McLeod who are who are trying to protect their constituents. And I get to tell her the, other, the flip side of the story and we can perhaps come to an agreement in some cases. You know, maybe not sometimes, but uh, that, that that's sort of what I do love about this job. And with regards to the housing issue, there's some actual actually $300 million worth of stimulus money that came through in South Carolina allocated it to the South Carolina Housing Authority. And it has a dual function, and this is how closely they're intertwined. It can be used for rental assistance or utility help. And so that's available out there right now for constituents, um, you know, to take advantage of if they, if they qualify. Senator McLeod, you know, my grandmother was educated, but she was smart. And I remember when I was seven, she said, Antoine, you're either gonna do two things in this world, never forget, either gonna be at the table or on the menu, you will decide. For so many people who look like us, being at the table has been a, been a marathon, not a sprint. For those who are on this panel and want to know how can they more influence those who are already at the table, who are setting the menu that they ultimately will have to decide upon, what can they do? Uh, we have the South Carolina chapter of the Association of Blacks and Energy, but what can they do? Because we often tell them vote, 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 but then they say, well, hell, my vote doesn't matter because everything I want, it doesn't get done. So what do you say to them and what do you tell them they can do from an advocacy standpoint to help move the needle? I think one of the things, and, you know, it varies. Um, I've given a lot of, that seems to be a, a, the burning question. You know, what can everyday people do to make a difference and, and um you're right, vote, we always say vote, 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 vote. But what I've discovered too is that they have to know who they are voting for. And the only way to do that is to, um, to be engaged and informed and recognize that everybody, you know, everybody honestly who is in a certain party or of a certain race that or or gender doesn't mean that they that their values and their vision and their um, ideals are in alignment with the people um, or with with yours specifically. Um, if we're talking to just everyday people who want to know uh, how to how to how to make sure that their voices are heard, I would encourage all of you to engage with us in, a, in meaningful ways because when you do that you will discover not just who we are but who you are um there are a lot of things that political uh that 
politicians, and I don't consider myself a politician. I am a public servant, and I know who I am, uh, and I know why I why God has me in this space. But there are a lot of politicians who whose interests who who are only interested in what serves them, not what serves you. And the more you engage with them and us, you will you will soon see the difference. Um, and it will just like you know some of the bills that I've introduced that were birthed out of things that I learned during certain experiences on my journey. The same thing will happen for people when they engage with us. They will um, discover, oh, this is how this impacts me. And, you know, I'm really careful and thoughtful and deliberate about sharing that information with my constituents and community members because I want them to know where I stand and I want them to know who I am and what informs my decisions and my, you know, my perspective and my vote. But not everybody is like that. So sometimes you have to dig for that information and you have to engage with your representatives and senators in, a, in meaningful ways that will enlighten you about what their positions are and perspectives are and what their politics are. Because a lot of times for too many, their politics overrides and trumps everything else. Um, and so once, I believe, once our constituents and community members know that and, and can see the difference, then they will you know, feel a lot more confident about whether it's voting against that person or running against that person. But I, I think those are the things that really inform people to get involved and get engaged on a more, on, on a more deliberate and uh, deeper level. For our audience, no, she wasn't trying to be funny when she said that politics trump everything else. I know some of y'all probably laughing when she said Trump and everything else. <laughs> but no, it wasn't trying to be funny. Pun intended. <laughs> no. Representative Penn Darvis, I want to come to you. You talked about affordable housing being uh, being infrastructure, meaning it's something we need in our communities. Uh, my friend Jonathan mentioned electric vehicles. Now, I know dang on well, I can't afford an electric vehicle right now. So how do we make, just like we want to make housing accessible and affordable, what should we do as we transition from there to here in terms of uh, infrastructure in this state and in this country, but also protecting our God-given resources, being more environmental friendly? What can we do from an electric car standpoint to make that a prioritization of making that affordable and accessible? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and Jonathan brought up an excellent point when he said that from an infrastructure standpoint, we have to be prepared as a state in order to be, be able to handle um, what's coming or what's coming down the road. We know electric is going to be what our future looks like as we get more get more information and that that comes down the pike. And I think as a, as a state, we have to prepare ourselves in order to do that. And so I think there are some things as a General Assembly we can do to incentivize um, you know, a lot of these manufacturers to come here or, you know, and, and, and certainly to more people to drive electric. Jonathan brought up a good point about the, the bill that was filed this year that is would essentially not consider um, these electric pumping stations as utilities, right? Something as simple as that to make the environment that more, the climate that more friendly um, for us to be able to foster electric and, and, and honestly the, the way of the future as we um, as we prepare for it. We know it's going to take some time. Um, we're just not prepared from an infrastructure standpoint as a state in order to handle that. And I and I suspect that as a General Assembly, that's something that we will have to make some, have some serious conversations about. But it all, it all surrounds building our infrastructure. And, and you saw what came out of the proposal that came from Congress, uh, the big infrastructure package that's been heavily debated. That's something um, that talks about that, right? And, and so as we see those uh, debates happen and we see what happens in South Carolina, what we're able to take advantage of, we're going to need to make sure uh, that from an infrastructure, infrastructure standpoint, we're prepared. Uh, Jonathan, Wayne Gretzky's father said that he was teaching him how to play hockey. He told him, don't go to where the puck is, go to where the puck is going to be if you want to be successful. From an energy company perspective like Dominion, 
this pandemic caught all of us, I think, uh, off guard. How can we be prepared uh, and how can you all be prepared for the next crisis that could hit the state and the impact it will have on ratepayers and customers as this pandemic has, has had? That's a good question, Antoine. I, and, and uh, you know, there's one thing people hate worse than high power bills, and that's being in the dark for, you know, more than a couple of days. And, uh, you know, there, we get back to sort of those, there was a bill that passed, actually a bill that passed last year that created a market reform study committee. Um, and in, the, in, in between the time that bill passed, uh, and right now they're talking about funding it either in the House or Senate. Uh, the Senate's already funded, excuse me, the House is, uh, has, has yet to act on funding it. But in between that time, Texas happened. And I think what we got to, as a state, what we got to be real careful about doing is, it, is looking at uh, some silver shiny object, thinking that it's going to get us free electricity and forget about reliability and infrastructure. And right now, I can tell you the regulated utility for all of its faults, you don't, the, the issues of reliability as long as there's a good regulatory climate, aren't as pronounced as they are in a place where the generators have no obligation to serve anybody. So if you're a generator in Texas, you don't have an obligation to serve. So you don't, you don't spend the extra money on weatherizing your equipment. You're just trying to get the lowest price at any given time. Well, here in South Carolina, we're constantly looking at weather patterns from, from history and we're saying, what do we need to do to make sure these plants can run during the most extreme event we could possibly imagine. And that's not to say things won't happen, but we have the incentive to prepare for them because in theory, we should be able to get recovery on those investments. Whereas again, in a quote unquote free market, which I would argue is not free, um, there is no incentive to do that. It, it is just who can provide, you know, who can bid in at the lowest price at any given hour in the day. But that being said, if you look down the line, we were just talking about electric vehicles. I think that's going to transform the way we deliver power. I mean, you're going to have these batteries, uh, you know, that may be charging at night um, and maybe during the morning they can deploy some of their excess usage to help our peak stay down. So maybe we don't have to build additional generation. Those are the things we have to look at. Renewables. We're in, we have a thousand megawatts of renewables on a 5,000 megawatt system. We're not there yet in terms of being able to rely on that 24 seven because the sun only shines 27% of the day. But we're going to move towards, you know, battery storage at some point but when it gets perfected. Right now, it only lasts a couple of hours, but there's going to come a time. Technology moves fast. And that's why at Dominion, for example, we have this Office of Innovation that is constantly looking at what the future might hold so that we don't, that, that we're not sitting here, you know, 15 years from now, five years behind. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's sort of the concept. I mean, there's experts who can figure that out a lot better than me, but I know that we're looking at it all the time. Well, we're starting to come around the mountain. Here we come. So I'm going to get to our closing. Uh, Senator Clyde, I'm going to give you one minute and 15 seconds to uh, give us your own benediction in your own Marlboro County slash Columbia way. Um, I just want to thank all of you for inviting me to speak today. This is this has been a really um, important conversation. We, we started, of course, by talking about the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And then we moved on to energy and, and infrastructure and affordable housing and some of the things that, that we know um, are necessary um, if we want to bring about meaningful change. Um, I would just encourage all who are listening and participating in this call to make sure that um, you are doing everything you can wherever you are. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're officially serving in public office or not. There's so much that, that all of us can do to, to uh, bring about the changes that we know we need and so i would just encourage everybody to do that and i'll leave you with another one of my favorite quotes um by rosa park she said i would like to be remembered uh as a person who wanted to be free and who also wanted uh others 
to be free. That is something that that motivates me and drives me, and um, I think it's a uh, it it's still uh, relevant, especially today. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Senator. Again, thank you for your service, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in a big way. Uh, really, really, yeah, really soon. Getting you some more good trouble. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to break any news for us today, do you, Senator? To <laughs> today. Not quite, not quite today, but stay tuned. All right, well, we'll be tuned in. Representative, Representative Pendarvis, my friend, my brother, thank you for your service. Uh, one minute, 13 second uh, benediction. Uh, not the revival version, the Sunday school benediction, because you know we got to get the service after Sunday school. I, I'll give you the AME version, okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you this, Antoine. First off, thank you to the organization that put this together. Antoine, Mia, Jonathan, it's always good seeing the three of you. You know, we talked a lot about energy today. We talked about current events and what's happening in our society. And as we continue to reflect on our individual roles as to what we can do, um, let's just keep in mind that as much as we've done uh, whether it's policy wise or uh, whether it's healing um you know and whatever it is there's much more work to do and i would just encourage everyone um to look at and examine the role that you're in and how you can make a difference and impact um your respective communities in a meaningful way um, we all have a purpose uh, whether in, we're in elected office appointed office or not um, each of you are on this call because you want to learn information. And so I just want to impart on you uh, that if not you, then who? As Senator McLeod said, and I'll add this version, if not now, then when? And now is always the perfect opportunity uh, to make our mark on the communities that we serve. And I'm just humbled to be part of your journey. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, Representative Pendarvis, uh, thank you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you in a real, real uh, big way, uh, really soon, too. Jonathan, uh, these, uh, these Baptists and the AME have taken up all the time, so I'm going to give you 45 seconds. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go all Reform Presbyterian on you, and I'll comment <laughs> on, since everybody else commented on George Floyd, I didn't really have the opportunity, and I will say, I'll keep with the theological theme, and, and I really do believe, you know, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, and all your mind, and the second one is like it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if we, if we could just all go throughout the day loving our neighbors as ourselves, a lot of these problems would take care of themselves. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be on this panel today with all of you. And uh, I just thank you for allowing me to participate. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll end how I started by saying what my mother and father said to me at a young age to be the two most important words in the English language, that's thank you. Thank you for every single one of you who took the time to join us. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I remember one of the last conversations I had with one of my mentors and friends the late Representative John Lewis. Uh, it was a three-way call with myself, him, and my political father, Jim Clyburn. And the one thing he said before we hung up the phone, he said, Antoine, uh, just know we all have an obligation to leave this little piece of real estate called America a little better, a little greener, and a little cleaner than we found it. And so I hope that all of our collective bodies of work will speak directly to what John Lewis asked of me on that Saturday conversation, the last conversation he and I had. Rondo Bannon, thank you for your friendship. Everybody behind the scenes, thank you. To the South Carolina chapter of the Association of Blacks and Energy, keep on keeping on. In the words of my grandmother, we're either going to be at the table or on the menu. You will decide. Thank you all.